Hey, welcome to the show. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Van the Total Connector. Um, as a continuation uh, of the talk which I had with Titus Gable and Jeff Booth, I wanted to go, you know, more into the creative visualization aspect of how we can communicate, translate um, the, you know, the bigger picture, the vision of humanity, of human civilization, uh, maybe even the next few years rooted in Bitcoin. And that's why um, I'm really excited to bring on Guy Swan and Richard James, who did the Hard Money film. You should definitely watch it. I'm going to put those in the show notes. And yeah, without further ado, this is going to be an epic talk because we're going to discuss what is the reality? I mean, what are the questions the average person asks himself or herself? What is the future going to look like? You know, whether we're talking about citadels, free private cities, deflationary economies, lower and lower prices, hardest and scarcest money, Bitcoin. When you combine all that, when you fuse all that into one bigger picture, you get a really beautiful picture. And that is what's what's the vision is about. It's like not only on an intellectualized, you know, hyper intellectualized level, but also on an emotional, visual and comprehension level. You know, how how do you want to communicate the bigger picture, the bigger comprehension uh, within Bitcoin and around and around Bitcoin to the, you know, to the mass of humanity. So, yeah, without further ado, I'm really excited and uh, let me know your questions afterwards and please share it, retweet it, follow me and subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much. God, I'm feeling so bullish right now for Bitcoin. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, yeah Dude, we need to talk about this. It's like What's a perfect the storm this way. Yeah. Stuff. Um, the micro strategy thing, man, I think, God, I think that's a huge, huge development. And I know that's they're like, a, not yeah, like some a huge trigger for like the biggest company in the world or anything, but just what their decision was, the way they did analysis on it and their thoughts as like they're they're holding it as their principle yeah it wasn't like oh, okay we'll put five percent or ten percent into bitcoin okay we'll go a bit to bitcoin and a bit to go it's like bang like yeah as you say they, they converted pretty much their entire cash holding in, into bitcoin yeah yeah it's absolute that's absolutely nuts and they did it specifically as a comparison as to like oh if we're holding cash dollars what is our potential yield off of this okay we can expect negative real yield uh, of holding our reserves here or we can basically embrace this virtualization trend and take the superior digital asset that has the highest architectural resilience and uh, highest network effect and with significant upside potential but also just a uh, the best inflation hedge that we could potentially get a hold of and we will just hold the dominant our dominant treasury holdings will be in bitcoin like they just said bitcoin is a better reserve asset for their company's holdings than the global reserve currency right now that press release i did was so boss <laughs> <laughs> just like yeah that was what was like actually i brought it up here the global acceptance brand recognition ecosystem vitality network dominance architectural resilience technical utility and community ethos of bitcoin is persuasive evidence of its superiority as an asset class <laughs> is that like, not that's the, the most bullish <laughs> quote you have ever heard <laughs> oh it's so good you get the goosebumps man okay let me let me start recording welcome to the show um to the whole Bitcoin podcast show. Hey, Richard, hey, Gabe, how are you guys doing? Thanks so much for your time. And um, we are actually waiting for Reed, but Reed seems to have internet uh, connectivity issues. So he said he might not be able to participate because, you know, uh, uh, whatever, because he he would be dropping up, you know, on and off. So let's just, you know, kickstart this whole thing. Um, hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, man, dude, thanks yeah. a lot for having me. It's good talk again. Yeah. It's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you, you guys were just talking about Microsoft. You know, that's a funny thing. It, it's a, uh, this, uh, what's his name? Sailor, the, the CEO of MicroStrategy. Mm -hmm. Is that Michael the guy? Saylor, da yeah. David Sailor is his name. It's the Michael funny Saylor. thing is that, 
Yeah, I didn't know that in 2013 or 14, he there's a quote from him, a tweet that he said, you know, where he said like, uh, well, then the days of Bitcoin are numbered, you know, going from one extreme to another. So <laughs> that's I find hilarious. And I didn't even know that yeah, my you... strategy is being actually owned by by what um, uh, uh, how, how many? How much percentage by Vanguard, Vanguard, and and um, BlackRock, right? Mm, they're the two biggest owners. I think they're both like above ten percent ownership. Yeah, uh, BlackRock owns like fifteen point two ish percent, I think, and uh, Vanguard owns eleven point seven percent of the company. So they are the two largest stakeholders in MicroStrategy, and MicroStrategy just just decided that their dominant, like their principal reserve asset will no longer be us dollars like us dollar cash it will be bitcoin and they they now hold 21,454 bitcoins <laughs> that's 0.1 percent of yeah. the total supply one yeah, one thousand it becomes this game of chicken like how many how many more companies can come out and say, yeah, we bought this percentage of the total Bitcoin supply? Because like only it's a, it's only a couple of hundred companies that will ever be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. The game theory, the game theory for that is uh, pretty bullish. <laughs> like just any kind of a return and like the beginning of an upward move, like in a feedback loop like that, particularly when uh, essentially all fiat currencies are essentially promising a negative yield just saying that like we're going to guarantee that you get a loss on your reserves um and to see that same thing like like you know a couple of steps that's only a couple of steps removed from doing the same analysis on treasury bonds which is a hundred trillion dollar market and like when those things are going zero and negative right. across the board and people start like companies, uh, companies and banks and investment firms start making those analyses. Like that, the game theory for Bitcoin is just potent. There, like, like that is a that is a winning ticket for Bitcoin. Yeah, like yeah. nobody. Yeah, it like, will trigger chain reaction. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a strong feedback loop. And and you know, and it becomes a fiduciary responsibility. You know, and it becomes a fiduciary responsibility uh, for, you know, it, it, it's totally ne negligent, a grossly negligent, or maybe even, you know, stupid. Uh, if, uh, you know, whatever, uh, and yeah, I think even pension funds, they're going to come into a situation, you know, pension fund, global pension funds, are, they're sitting on like, what, 40, 50 trillion US dollars or something? Mm -hmm. Like global, you know, uh, wealth, asset management, whatever you call it. So, and then, you know, when you talk about like Vanguard or, or uh, BlackRock, uh, how many trillions of asset management are they sitting on? Like seven to 10 or something? Yeah, BlackRock is uh, 7.6 as of quarter four, 2019. I think it's a little bit higher now. Um, and then Vanguard mm -hmm. is like six point something, 6.2 or something like that. Yeah, but I mean, you know, in 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 in, uh, in dollar terms, they're, they're, yeah. they have. To, I mean, this is this is a, like a super signal to all the other institutions, and so it it does not go unnoticed. That's what I'm trying to say. So, <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, it becomes Definitely. a fiduciary responsibility to have Bitcoin in your portfolio. Otherwise, it's totally stupid and grossly negligent, you know, not to have yeah. it. Well, well, you're immediately entering because of all the a... reasons you just stated, right? Oh yeah, yeah, and and you're also immediately entering into a like a, a market a market position like like for the total addressable market of someone in that position making that decision for those reasons you're looking at 100x of bitcoin market cap potential like without really a whole lot of a whole lot of hard work. You, you know like it, as soon as it's being seen in as a, as a comparative to the reserve asset, it's like a million dollar Bitcoin isn't that hard to imagine. Um, and the fact that they've made that analysis and come to that conclusion in this, by taking the whole macro environment yeah. into account is unbelievable. Um, unbelievable, yeah. 
I heard Preston nope. Fish on uh, Nath- Nath- what's his name, Nathaniel uh, Withamore or something like that. I'm not sure. Nathaniel's show breakdown podcast. He said, yeah, uh, that was one. Yeah, yeah. He said it was one of the wisest decisions they've made, and uh, he sees like um, he estimates that um, micro strategies uh, uh, value valuation could go up like 10x. Uh, or uh, he said up to, yeah, something t- 10 to 13 X or something. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, if you, yeah, because the Bitcoin now represents fully 50% of the equity of the entire company. So if Bitcoin does 10 X, yeah. then that's going to flow straight through to the, to the market cap of the business. And mm-hmm. yeah, and I, I listened to that, that as well. Because it's interesting the way his thesis, you know, he's been talking about this for a long time. And I was Preston as someone who's made a career of, of invest, you know, assessing companies and, and investing in, in in companies following a value strategy, and said, "Look, I'm not, I'm not interested in this strategy again until companies start adopting Bitcoin as a reserve asset or converting some percentage of their cash flows into Bitcoin." Um, so he and he's been saying for a long time, it's just a matter of time before before I start doing this, and that's the thing that's going to make me pay attention to companies again, um, and that even if if you look at the the revenue of MicroStrategy and then what they're converting on their bottom line in terms of in terms of net profit, even if that stays flat, um, you're still going to see the, the market cap of the company go crazy if it's if it's related to the price of Bitcoin. And so that I mean, we already saw the the stock price jump 10 percent or more. It's seventeen um, so yeah, percent now. If, oh it's wow! Another, it jumped another seven <laughs> percent today so far. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's going to make other other companies stand up and take notice. And I mean, look, I think this is something we've all been expecting to a certain extent for a long time. But uh, but I, and I think maybe none of us were probably expecting just the, the size of the, of the allocation, nor the the validation that comes with those those owners. Like that, you know, it's really um, you know you saw Paul G- Tudor Jones come out and endorse Bitcoin, um, and that. Sort of got rid of this career risk for a whole host of um, people, and and then this this does the same thing for, for that corporate world. And I think this is because Paul, Paul Tudor Jones was only ever talking about being in the derivative market, um, whereas with MicroStrategy, they're actually you know, they've actually purchased the bit and are holding the Bitcoin. So that's a that's a huge thing as well. Yeah, yeah. Um... Uh, that's the fact that they're actually holding Bitcoin is a huge is a huge part of it. And what's funny is you talk about like, you know, I don't think we were really expecting it this way. Um, I totally didn't. I, I, I expected kind of a um, uh, kind of a general progression that like Paul Tudor Jones said that he has now like two percent of his assets held in Bitcoin. I expected that to become the norm for quite some time before you started seeing a situation like MicroStrategy come about. That We have a lot of, uh, we've got 1% of our hedge funds now in Bitcoin. We've got 0.8% of our pensions now, uh, you know, hedging this uh, situation with uh, the strongest digital asset, like a bunch of small allocations starting to build before, um, uh, uh, before we kind of landed in the realm of, okay, now let's look at companies that are actually considering their reserve assets, that Bitcoin is stable and legitimate enough to hold that there. And it was like, we got like four announcements of just, you know, a couple of major financial individuals who were like, yeah, this is actually really, I think Bitcoin is actually really strong and I have a very small position for it. And then it's like micro strategies, like, yeah, it's our reserve asset now. Like, like our holdings You're, are in Bitcoin and it's like, oh, holy uh, shit. <laughs> yeah, all of our kind of predictions about this, the kind of next phase have been based on exactly that, that 1% or 2% allocation, mainstream allocation, not 50%. <laughs> uh, so we might need to revise, revise everything. It's making me think that yeah, this yes. cycle could be so much more intense than I had originally anticipated. Um, like, like if, if we're moving into the major corporate entities and uh, financial entities and potentially even governments considering this a viable... Yeah, that's what I was going to say, the governments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, that's my question. I mean, what what, what do you think uh, uh, if governments, you know, uh, take take Bitcoin, you know, more and more as a reserve currency or, you know, as a as a hedge, would you say that it has even a great, a much, much greater impact? And if gradually and suddenly, you know, all the big institutions like right now, you know, with whatever Vanguard, BlackRock um, uh, as co-owners of substantial co-owners of MicroStrategy, or do you think a pension fund is going to come in now? Or what's your assessment? Uh, I think just just in the general sense, like this is the beginning of the game theory, right? Like it's a feedback loop mm -hmm. um, and it's an unbelievably powerful feedback loop because a as the price rises, it's such a scarce asset with such a low inflation rate now that as uh, just two or three major entities make a decision like this, it's going to push that price up, which is going to create that same feedback loop of more people securing it. Um, a greater legitimacy in the eyes of everybody in the financial system, people taking a second and third look at this thing that have been dismissing it for a very long time, and then they're going to see their competitors' stocks jumping 17%, 20-30%. Like in, in major ways going, we can't just look away from this anymore, um, and reconsidering their own reserves, which everything reinforces itself, you know, it gets stronger, it gets more resilient, it gets more decentralized, it's exposed in, uh, it's spread across more jurisdictions, and is increasingly less and less risk in that environment. And the game theory suggests that, like, as soon as the ball gets rolling on that, the, the dominoes don't stop, don't unfall, you know, like they just, it starts to yeah. spread like a fire. Yeah. And it will, yeah. Yeah, it will accelerate. Actually, you know, the when Corey Clipson, uh, I mean, I, I always called it critical adoption rate, but I think he even wrote an article on the intransigent minority or something like 10 million people. Or, uh, mm. I think it was yeah, I read that one on the, the show, US, actually. Uh, only, but nevertheless. Yeah, yeah. So whatever it is, I mean, I thought the, the critical, the real critical adoption rate would be the critical mass would be somewhere between 300 and 500 million people around the world so this is where we take off but i think all everything that you just described you know and the institutions coming in i think this will accelerate the critical adoption process much much faster so the gradual and suddenly process will actually speed up by order of magnitude now but mm. and the interesting thing about the government adoption is that unlike a, a company like microstrategy that's a public company i mean they're obliged to disclose their, that, that purchase or their holdings, um, you know, at least at the, at the end of each quarter, they've got to, they've got to make that public knowledge. Um, they, they can't hide that. Whereas a government has the option to not necessarily disclose it. Um, and so, so that's what I find yeah. interesting is that it, it may be happening. It may have been happening for a while um, or, or it may start and, and we might not know about it for a while um, because, a, a, you know, a government announcing that they are um, that they purchase Bitcoin would be that that next step. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, let's transition to the uh, the one topic we wanted to talk about. Um, uh, by the way, it was a it was a really fascinating talk yesterday with uh, Jeff Booth and uh, Titus Gable. I read both of the books and I had, after I had read both of the books, first I had, you know, read Jeff Wood's book, uh, um, why, uh, The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. And whenever you have some time, please read, really, uh, if you haven't read both of them, but, but I guess, Guy, you have... I lost you. Can you hear him? No, I just dropped dropped out there. Just dropped out. I have listened to the price of tomorrow. I haven't I haven't read it, but I listened to the audiobook as soon as everybody started talking about it. It is amazing. Um, like some of his some of his economic assessment, I think, is actually a little bit off. Um, but his general um, assessment of just kind of like the huge de deflationary push, just the technology has. Um, it is so it's completely spot on. I think he looks at history a little bit incorrectly, though, thinking about how like, oh, well, debts were sustainable for this, this and this. And I think 
I think that whole problem was actually just a matter of time. Like we, we had a fundamentally broken economic system, regardless of whether or not we have this huge deflationary push. Um, in fact, the deflationary push is kind of the only reason we were able to sustain the levels of false debts um, that, that we were able to do because at the same time we had such a huge increase in production that essentially we were able to stave off uh, the poverty that would have come uh, quicker. Um, but, but he's absolutely right in the price of tomorrow that uh, that push is it, like it's going to accelerate and there's, there's no way to prop it up. I mean, I think we've already reached the point of no return and we're just kind of watching this thing play out right now. And COVID has kind of been the catalyst for that, uh, that move. I don't, I don't think we walk this back at this point. Yeah, I agree guy that it's, I think, yeah, having also read Jeff's book book and, and not necessarily agreeing with everything in the book, I, I do think his insight about the, the deflationary impact of technology is probably or it, the, the most profound insight in, in the sort of Bitcoin and the macroeconomic narrative um, or, or the most novel insight that I think is really, um, you know, is really going to make an impact. So, yeah, I think it is, it is a, just an important book um, to understand in that sense. And I also agree that it, it's been that, that counterweight that sort of to, to the inflationary policy of, of uh, and, and the, the increasing debts that the reason that we haven't seen we ha haven't seen CPI inflation. Um, I mean, we've seen asset price inflation, but perhaps we've been able to get away with what, with what we've been doing and not have it flow into um, consumer price inflation because the, the deflationary effect of advanced technology has been so strong and, and as jeff says will we'll continue to, to get stronger um and so you just have these two two opposing forces um pushing against each other to the point where it just becomes unsustainable yeah. yeah and one of those forces is is inherently unsustainable and one of those forces is basically impossible to contend with it is it is a natural and uncontrollable force and no matter what the government does they're not going to be able to stop it. Like technology is the very sort of thing that upon its invention, it changes the, env the very environment that the government has to, has to operate under. Um, and even, even with all their control and all of the violence that's attempts to basically hold it off and the, um, the manipulation that they intend to hold it off with, capital controls. I mean, just look at like the automobile. Like in an effort to try to prevent the automobile from happening because the normal government pressures are defend the incumbents. And who were the incumbents? They were the carriage builders. They were the everybody who like had this huge um they, they weren't the automobile, they were the young new tech people, essentially. Um and what did they do? They literally created a law that you had to hire a person to walk in front of of your vehicle because it was a death machine it had to it could only drive at like a max of like nine miles an hour or something like that and you had to have somebody waving a big orange flag in front of you because <laughs> you were just going to run over and murder everybody on the streets with this death machine but how long did that last do we have that problem today no they, they it's it's just a matter of time they can do everything that they want to try to stop technology but you can't uninvent a thing um, and basically on every front, they are dealing with, like, like we're dealing with unprecedented moves. I mean, look at 3D printing and the hilarious attempts to reinstitute gun control. Um, like it just, and, and then decentralized, independent, global digital money. Um, and the, the recovering of privacy in the digital age that we're finally getting back and that digital independent money is becoming such a um uh basically uh, a huge instigator a force for doubling down and uh increasing the push in that direction um and the the reestablishment of sovereignty on the internet um all these trends that have been slowly going the wrong way for 15 20 years of the internet, like all this potential that we saw at the beginning that started to just turn away, are now getting a flood, a powerful flood back in the opposite direction, um, back towards sovereignty 
and independence and systems that are non-jurisdictional that have nothing to do with governments and are completely outside of their control and their purview um and that is fundamentally going to change the world um and i don't think i don't think people have even begun to realize just how much um that will be yeah and you know what was interesting in in the talk with uh jeff boots and titus cable um that's a quote uh, from jeff Booth. actually i i put it on tw on twitter he said the governments are going to be forced to play by the rules that are not inflationary. They're going to be forced, otherwise the currencies are going to break. The next step is to set up areas. We were talking about you know free, free private cities. If you want, you want to call it Citadel, Bitcoin Citadel, or whatever. The next step is to set up areas that encourage people with Bitcoin and everything else to move there. So the governments will literally be forced, be in a position, uh, you know, get into a position where they have to offer uh, because of the competitive nature, because of the incentive game or or game theory, if you want to call it, um, you know, to. <laughs> To compete with these new uh, emerging free private cities, you know, uh, where it's you know totally self-autonomous, self-sovereign, really uh, true free market capitalist principles, uh, where you know life, liberty, and pr property are are protected, um, you know, really simple model. But this is actually how it should have been the whole time, especially the last hundred years. But uh, because of this, you know, of the centralized, criminally immune central banking system, we don't have that, right? So this is what's, you know, unstoppable. Uh, and, you know, as, as Richard also said, but you know, both of you actually discussed now the deflationary part of it. This is what's so exciting, you know, like when you put, like when you bring in the, te the technology, the deflationary econo economics and, and deflationary technologies, especially not only the existing technology, but the technologies. I'm thinking, you know, just just out of my head now, you know, I'm thinking of you know totally new transportation systems within the you know free private city. Let's say, you know, a, a much more advanced um, tr a train system or transportation system than they have in Japan. You know, where it's going on magnetical tracks. So you know. So I want to tie this in with the with the topic I want to talk to you about is that how do you because I was like, wow, this is such a realistic enlightenment I've had after reading those two books, you know, like free private cities, you've got deflation, you've got zero to one, okay, leave it at zero to one, maybe out, but I'm just saying it's like, it's it really this is this is the playing field for for technological innovation for the first time, where you you bring in all the entrepreneurs. There are like thousands of or Elon Musk. And Elon Musk was like at the right time, right place. I mean, I have high respect for him. But I mean, imagine how many entrepreneurs, like innovative, uh, inventing, uh, uh, you know, people there are out there who are, you know, who have uh, not only the resources but the ideas, the knowledge, the, the know-how. Um, this is what I see. I see a future. But uh, the, the thing I want to talk to you about is like, how can we communicate? Like I loved your what you what you did by the way, Richard. You know, hard money because it's really educational. It in a in a really playful way, you know, with the animation, with the cartoons, with the old uh, scenes from the whatever early twentieth century. I really love that because it it um, uh, it's not so you know it it's not so heavy you know from uh, it's not too intellectualized. Uh, but yeah, it, I think it's that's still, oh, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's an important um, angle to take as well. To not, I mean, and, and I guess it's a double-edged sword. In in order to to give it that entertainment value, there's a, there's a necessary compromise to some extent. Like you have to um, you have to make make some of the concepts, or, or you have to present concepts um, in a way that may be a little bit biased or, or not not giving the full story but um but i think that's a, that's a necessary sacrifice to make and and i think that um that narrative about sound money and 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 the the, the way governments have exploited money to to their advantage is in some ways an e not an, it's an easier narrative to tell because it um you know it, 
it's, it's something that people can understand or, or, or you can almost put people into character roles like the, the state, the government is the villain and, and they're sort of playing an exploitative role and, and sound money presents itself as, as the hero or, or the solution. Um, and you can tell, tell a story that way. Um, and, and Bitcoin almost doesn't, doesn't come into the picture until later on. And Bitcoin, I think, is harder to present um, to, to a wider audience I mean, you you can sort of explain the, you know, what why it's a good thing j just but just by talking about the the hard cap. Like, okay, there's only twenty one million coins. It's a deflationary money, and we can talk about why that is important and why we think that's a good thing. But certainly from my perspective, I couldn't take that claim seriously until I spent the time and effort to understand the technology. Like, how is um, Bitcoin protected by cryptography and really get into the, the nuts of that. And that's not an easy thing to explain. Uh, you know, I think you guys would agree that to really get your head around that takes possibly hundreds of hours. So to, to try and present that to someone in a short, um, entertaining fashion is, is really challenging. Mm. Yeah, dude, I got to say, um, uh, I thought I thought the documentary was was just awesome. Um, uh, what you put, and I gotta say, I'm like, I'm super super jacked to have been the last word <laughs> on that thing. I was like, I was like, oh, snap, that's me. I, uh, Man, I sent it you my, nailed like, it. It was rambling. yeah. I sent it to all my friends and family. Section to finish. <laughs> yeah, I bragged. I bragged about that shit all day. <laughs> Oh man, but that was that was really really good, and it's it was a great short and simple breakdown. Like you say, like you know, you have to kind of um, it, like there's no way to tell the whole story, every little detail. But what you need is a strong narrative that is correct. You know that that tells the trend, that that it shows the major forces at work without getting into the weeds because people are so lost by the weeds. Um, and it does such a good job of just telling the story of sound money. Um, and uh, I, I really enjoyed it. I watched it twice um, and have sent it to numerous people. So uh, kudos on that a lot. Yeah. yeah. No, thank That's you. Great. And, and it, yeah, it was a matter of, of really drawing on resources that already existed. Like it was, it was not about going out there and trying to, to recreate something it was it was drawing on the the knowledge and the discussions that that are that are already been having in the community like there's so much good um good discussion out there um there was was uh, i was able to build the narrative for, for you know from from what we already had it, there wasn't any need to go out and and do something new it was just distilling those those really important points and then putting them into a you know into an order that that told the story yeah, it inspires so, people, you know, to go down, uh, you know, deeper the rabbit hole, and that's what's what I think you've you've really achieved. Your mission is accomplished because it 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 triggers people because it it gives them the question, the inspiration, like why why is it, you know, because the comprehension process is really difficult. For, I think for a lot of people to even understand you know the, the root causes of of all these symptoms like oh really is it really the money like the but most people don't even know that it's uh you know, what is controlling the the issuance of money or, or the control of money and i think these are like you know some essential points that yeah i think it's not an exaggeration to, to say that the money is at that that root cause of, of just about every problem and I think you know we've we've talked you know I think we, it would be interesting to tie this all back to the concept of of you know the future that we envision and um, that's why I think what Titus Gabe was doing with his his private cities initiative is so fascinating because you know we're sort of speculating he's actually going out there and try for, trying to institute um, something on the ground that he thinks is building a better future and he's going to encounter some seriously hard problems um, but but I think it's such a, an amazing initiative and and the, once again the money and, and Jeff this is the thing that Jeff was most interested in your discussion um, in the, the the money element and, and how Bitcoin might work uh, and he, he saw some problems with that and I think look it, it's no exaggeration to say that Oh, we're talking about oh, could you know could a government set up a, a, a zone within its 
country where Bitcoin was, was the main currency? Yes and no. I think the, the, the problem is that it's not like it, it's, a, it's an all or nothing. It's like Bitcoin is such a if, if a government is going to use or endorse Bitcoin as, as currency, that's just a fundamental shift from the current the current setup. It's like that they can't Bitcoin compl and the whole point of Bitcoin is it stops the ability of governments to profit from seniorage, profit from the ability to manipulate their currency um, and extract wealth from their citizens. And one of my favorite reads of, of guys on Bitcoin Audible is is the article by Alan Greenspan at the the where he's talking about it's it's from the sixties I think and he's talking about the role of God and like he admits that you know the entire concept of government as we know it is based on this exploitative system where the state extracts wealth from its citizens like yeah. the entire concept of social democracy is based on that and so a world where bitcoin is the currency for, for better or worse will be so fundamentally different from from what we currently think about our our sort of social contract like government will be just such a shrunken um entity in in a world of sound money that yeah, I think would, most would, people would, just can't even fathom just that. become obsolete, right? It would just become obsolete yeah. by itself. I mean, yeah, that's what Buckminster Fuller or, or Hayek, you know, or, you know, all these quotes that we, you know, we sometimes read or, or uh, quote um, when, you know, we build new models, we build new concepts and, and totally new structures and the old ones become obsolete. And I think this is what, what I'm, you know, this is what I was trying to make the point yesterday in our, in the discussion with Jeff Putin, to scale three private cities or citadel cities, like the, 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 the Bitcoin standard, like as a standard, but, but not like as a, as a compulsory, like a, you know, it's a free market. Like if anybody else wants to trade with gold or any other currencies, you know, let them try, you know, but in, in the end, Whatever law that is, is it Thiers law, Gresham's law, or you know the shelling point? It's it's eventually all people are gonna you know converge to Bitcoin <laughs> sooner or later. What's funny is that the the element you were talking about with um uh, like I, I love that Alan Greenspan article when I stumbled upon it. I think it had actually had been something that I had read years and years before, but had kind of forgotten about. And oh, yeah. mm -hmm. somebody like recommended it to me or something. I don't remember how I stumbled back upon it, but I was like, oh my god, this is so great. Um, and it's so funny to have it somebody breaking down exactly how it works from somebody who did so um, so profoundly the opposite when they were oh, in charge it's, it's, of it's the hypocrisy of it is just isn't it weird that's funny isn't it weird how people sell out their soul i mean yeah <laughs> yeah um but uh i love that piece because of that um but um is that I think that we'll actually still be using, like, like, like you say, government is going to be, it's so dependent upon, like, like the modern nation state as we know it is so dependent upon the control of money. Um, like it is truly the cornerstone of where it gets its purchasing power and its ability to quote unquote direct uh direct its population to to basically control and be the economic uh, uh master in a sense um and uh and there, it is no coincidence that every nation state today has a full-on legally enforced and um uh 100 printing policy monopoly over the currency and that if you want any debts like legal tender laws it, they're ubiquitous it's not like some do and some don't it's always it is the one thing that they all have like perfectly in common um and the first time that a government basically says you know we are now backing our currency by a combination of gold and bitcoin um i think a it will uh it, it will create an incredible amount of faith and uh, bolster whatever currency that is but it will be initially it, it will be essentially the uh the, the that step in changing the game it's the admission that this is no longer the game theory of currency that bitcoin is such an important player that we can't play the game the same as it was and uh because the very power of government in the modern day is over 
uh, is in its control of the currency and its control over whether or not people can leave the, the leave the country without with their capital. Um, Bitcoin is such a game changer in that. I mean, you just memorize some words and leave the country with a billion dollars and there's nothing they can do. Um, yeah, that's that, that exists. Thing. You know, you don't need anything. I mean, you know, it's, it's like totally uh, censorship resistant and, and borderless. You know, it's it's yeah. it's nothing can stop it. And that's the thing, you know, and it will create such strong competition between juris jurisdictions that I think we will see a really and to see the macro environment already. Like, like I feel like borders and political jurisdictions are cracking everywhere. Um, and to, to have that running its course at the exact same time that such a powerful new dynamic is introduced, um, that we will see a massive balkanization of, uh, of political jurisdictions across the world. We, we will see country after country break up into five districts, into 50 states. Um, no longer one government. Like, like I think we will see this over and over in this yeah. this same question we're talking about. And we could even, yeah, that, you know, it could could really happen that Wyoming could secede from the United States. That's what I'm hoping for. You know, it would be awesome. Wyoming, you know, the cowboy story, like totally seceding. <laughs> Heck yeah, man! I'm down. I'm do let's just let's just do it. We're overdue for. We got to fix it. We got to fix it. And I don't see any. There's there is zero federal solution to the nightmare we are in. It only makes sense that we go our separate ways and get over it and pull our pants up and be adults and fix our own damn problems. Yeah. The yeah. only thing I'm really waiting for is like, uh, and I know, you know, it just, it just, uh, once we, uh, you know, as, as, as it goes, you know, the saying Bitcoin fixes this, but it really is the, the, the core solution to this whole thing, because once we have this, this is why I wanted, okay, this is why, this is the vision, okay, and and my question to you guys is like, how can we communicate, how can we visualize the future, how it could realistically, not dystopia, not utopia, not some kind of fantasy bullshit, but really, like, if we think it through, like, what is already here, what is available, uh, would it be, you know, okay, we've got the monetary economical system, then we, you know, right, right you know, immediately after that, comes the technology for me, you know. So um, there's so many entrepreneurs out there who are just waiting, inventors, engineers, uh, investors, they're just waiting to, you know, to, to participate in a project, whether it be, you know, seasteading or free private cities projects or uh, technological, you know, new infrastructures, whether it be energy conversion, energy efficiency processes, uh, transportation systems, um, and as Jeff Booth says, you know, I mean, who would object to a civilization or to a miniaturized civilization where you pay less and less, you know, the value of money goes up and up and up like Bitcoin does. It's a deflationary money by nature. So, um, so a question to you, Richard, I mean, you know, wouldn't that be like, uh, we go a little bit, a few steps ahead, you know, from understanding, comprehending the root causes to this is the reality we could live in. This is the real reality we could live in. Um, with a deflationary economics, deflationary technology, with uh, free market principles, with true uh, entrepreneurship and, inno uh, and innovative spirit. Um, you know, just, just how could we visualize this is the future that could, uh, you know, be be manifested by order of magnitude, you know? Mm, I think that the, if, if this future, you know, we, we're all envisaging, a, you know, a certain future. And I think the one thing is that um, when it comes to Bitcoin, and, and you guys talked about this, I think on your last conversation a couple of weeks ago, it, it's a real um, expression of, of radical personal responsibility. Um, when it comes to money, and and this has an expression in a lot of other aspects of life. So certainly for me, um, sending my first Bitcoin transaction, um, like from an exchange to your own wallet, that that was an incredibly terrifying experience because <laughs> all of a sudden 
you're the uh, you're in, you're responsible like you're the only person in control of this you accept full responsibility there's no bank there's no government backstop um it, it it's freedom but it's it's ultimate responsibility as well uh and i think that philosophy certainly for me applies to the way i view the world in terms of what i value in the world you know i value a, a world where there's more individual freedom that's what i'd like to see but for better or worse and i think certainly for the better but for most people it's a scary thought that that comes with responsibility um you know that there's no there's not necessarily a safety net there um and and so people are are very just so so used to a world where you know the government provides them with a safety net that um it, it's a terrifying prospect for most people to see that um if if you accept freedom then you're it, 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 that's no guarantee of a good result that that just means there's a level playing field for everyone and i think it is important for us to present in a positive way our view of the future and, and why we think bitcoin and the changes bitcoin might bring um are good like i think um and i think bitcoin is such a, a positive because it's a it's a financial opportunity for the every man so it's a chance for everyone to participate in a really good asymmetric bet and and it's a chance to profit but at the same time it's also what we think um is the is the most effective way to protest against a lot of the current problems we have and to build a better future so it's this it's this double whammy of good and good for 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 the average person um but unfortunately i worry that the, in terms of what the future holds for the shape of society or for individuals I I think that in the end the the main force for change might be from from the negative end like I, like I think that unfor- like hopefully we can re- we can reach a wider audience but I think for a lot of people they're going to have um bitcoin and what it represents forced upon them by economic reality and I think gov- the same thing you could perhaps say for governments like I think unfortunately um i'd i'd love to see see a positive outcome but i worry that um because bitcoin is so antithetical to the whole concept of government i i worry that that governments will sort of fight back against this and and this is talked about a lot in the sovereign individual the book that it's now um 25 years old and things are kind of playing out quite quite as, as they said which is that yes um you know the um the advancement of computing technology um and and specifically um uh, the development of digital assets so value that is not tangible like that will, they see that as the driving force um that will take power away from government and that's a good thing in the long run but the problem is that in the medium term governments will probably fight back against that you know they they predicted that that they predicted sort of that there there might be populist uprising um so i worry that um whilst we might be gaining freedom and sovereignty and and some financial independence i i worry that governments might f- up the ante in a in a negative sense in terms of increasing their taxation and incursions into freedom Uh, on people and on assets that they do still have the ability to get at. So do you see emer- yeah I'm sorry do do you see like, like emergence of parallel societies then? I mean because there there will, will be there will be friction there will be a resistance of course there will be um I I'm I'm, I'm, I'm afraid too that it's not going to be like you know peacefully all everything and and you know super harmonious. <laughs> so uh but do you see because of that uh, you know a f- much faster uh, exponential uh, emergence of of whatever you would call it like pri- free private cities uh, autonomous regions uh, you know uh, i think that would be a really good thing uh, and and look that's what um that's what they predict in the sovereign individual as as the mega political trend is a, is a breaking down of the level at which society is organized and that that will involve successions and then i i think that that is a good thing and if you if you read 
sort of more traditional libertarian writers like Murray Rothbard or Hans Hermann Hopper, they talk about succession as being one of the main drivers of the chance for society to, to regain some of its freedom. Um, you know, you can't just destroy government um, altogether in one hit. Um, so the, the logical step is to allow smaller um be they states within within nations or communities to, to succeed um because I, th I do think that's the solution is once you get um instead of 200 nation states um with a, with a huge power as the monopolist on violence in that state as, you, as soon as that starts to break down uh, and you get smaller entities each each pursuing its own philosophy of of the social contract you're almost going to see see the world function more like a free market where those those that do well will succeed and those that don't will not and so um you're going to see more of that ground up um spontaneous complexity al al allowed to to run its course so i think um I, I would love to see whether it's something that we can build positively in the way that titus gable is, is trying or whether it's something that's just forced upon the world by mega political reality i i think it's a good thing I, to I totally agree. Um, I think uh, I think just in the nature of well, well, the threat and the lack of health in the fiat currency atmosphere right now, like in the in the entire eco, the global financial ecosystem, um, that those who actually manage to get their sovereignty back, whether it be um, some very wealthy corporations, wealthy individuals, um, you know, some serious OG Bitcoiners who hold to, you know, 500K per Bitcoin, um, that they will have, as the purchasing power of state institutions fall and the purchasing power of sovereign individuals rise, um, they will increasingly have to negotiate um, and they will have to reach out and fight to compete to get that capital near or within their jurisdictions you know like they will uh, i think this is exactly what will lead to the rise of private cities um and i think the 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 we're building a citadel like like where's your citadel going to be joke is is part a joke but part completely serious um like there are there are people with real capital who are genuinely considering like i'm not it's not a joke to me i mean it is and it's fun but it's also a serious thing like like at some point, I fully intend to be shopping private cities that I think are going to be a part of the new reality. Um, come four or five years from now, uh, major investors are going to be uh, doing jurisdictional arbitrage. They're going to set up contracts with countries that um, are willing to uh, uh, make uh, tax deals or tax havens um, and they're going to be desperate for it because they are going to be losing purchasing power and they need capital in their jurisdiction. I mean, Mexico has done this. Um, there have been multiple uh, in southern North America and in South America countries that have uh, done very similar things that have started to sell land or try to get, um, I think it's uh, Honduras uh, had one that's... Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I expect that to accelerate. Because they even had to change their constitution uh, for, for the free private cities, uh, yep. Titus Gable said. So, yeah, but the thing is, you know, one is always at the mercy of the state. This is what I'm concerned about a little bit because, I mean, of course, it depends, you know, what, what region, you know, is it more stable, less stable? And I guess, you know, Honduras is, you know, maybe that's the reason they did it there is because it is... Had as a, as a tendency uh, to a more stable uh, uh, government over there, so they had to change their whatever provisions in their constitutions. And but the thing is, you're always you know still at the mercy of you know is will it be a putsch, a coup, or you know some kind of uh, dictatorship you know taking over? You never know, you know. So uh, in the end, um, like and I think this is something he took care Jeff Booth also touched upon, like. Once you become so self-sufficient, so self-sovereign, and uh, super highly advanced technologically uh, within the free private cities, you could even, you know, it's even imaginable that these free private cities, however small they are, 
they could develop like uh, just purely defensive technologies to defend themselves from intruders, from uh, you know any entity that might attack them. So this is you know I think a a, a point that we should also be um, uh, concerned about. But would you? Yeah, I yeah I agree. Ahead. I think um, you know I share that concern that you're still going to be at, at at the mercy of whatever nation state you're living under the jurisdiction of, even if they've made made certain concessions. Um, and, and Titus talks about how he thinks this, that it, the concept could work in a, in a negotiation because there are um, there are benefits to it to a nation state to having a zone like this in terms of capital flowing in. Um, but I I agree with you. My concern is that the that's only useful for a nation state if if they can figure out some way to extract rent um in a parasitic sense from from what you're doing so uh, and there's gonna there's another cost there so i think you know the, the real true expression of this this private city i think it can only reach its fullest expression once you have a a self-contained entity that actually does have a monopoly on violence like as you say like they have the capacity to defend themselves um, from real violence if necessary as unpleasant as that is to imagine i do think that um unfortunately it's the it is the risks and rewards to violence and how how you control that that, that in the end dictates the structure of society how would you um my question to you both of you is like how would you i mean you know it takes it takes some resources it takes time it takes uh you know energy and resources and organizational uh stuff uh, to you know to do a movie like that and it you know it needs money but how would you i mean i'm thinking uh, realistically you know uh realistically it would be maybe possible to make a teaser like for three minutes you know when you see those Tesla commercials from Elon Musk, you know, <laughs> there's some really good commercials where, you know, they convey the, the, the feeling, the, the, the real vision of what it, what it is like to have a Tesla, you know, like what it is, what is it like to have, you know, to live on Bitcoin, to be rooted in a human civilization, whatever that is, uh, a miniaturized, a parallel city, a, a, a pre-private city, a citadel, um, but what like I think the question people would could be asking is so like okay you know okay then we have okay it's a it's 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 a hard scar it's money okay we got that we we understand the root problems now but what would the how would the lives of the average person out there change in such a society and I think if we can together you know like as a as brains coming together creative people like you um, how how can we it translate like converse this convert this into a into a language into a visual language into a uh, with a feeling with a with a vision with that that is somehow you know balanced between emotional rational uh, and and comprehension level. That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. um, you know, if we can achieve uh, that, if we can achieve that, we can reach people in the hearts, in the minds, in the brains, and 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 explain to them this is the reality we could live in. You know, yeah. I mean, what does a deflationary economy really look like? We never had that. Not even not even our parents or grandparents had that actually. You know, so w what kind of civilization? You know. I mean, actually, we should have had this civilization 100 years ago, but they all fucked it up, you know, because, <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever reason, you know, but it, was it ignorance? Was it, uh, yeah, was it greed? Was it, uh, was it stupidity or was it really like super centralized criminality? And this is what's been going on the last, at least the last 100 years. Yeah, I think it's a... I agree with you that you know we we've got nothing to compare to except our, our modern society, and, and we like to think that we're well, we've come a long way, or that, or that we've reached a certain level of wealth, and we have. Um, but imagine, yeah, put yourself in a position where you imagine where you're in a society where, first of all, instead of the state taking immediately fifty percent of all the productive value that you create, instead of that. 
um, it's a, you get to keep 100% of that value minus whatever the real cost is of, of the protection service. So instead of a rent seeker you ha in charge, um, you have a, a genuine um, competitive entity that, that is, is providing you protection from violence and you're only paying the true cost of that because we live in some kind of competitive world where um, states have to compete on that basis. So all of a sudden you've doubled, just doubled your, product, your productive output just from that alone then you have multiply that by the ins the new incentive structure that's created so if if you're if you know now that you own 100 percent of the value that you create instead of knowing that 50 percent of it's going to be stolen from you the mo that's incredibly motivating because all of a sudden, you know, it encourages you to to go out there and produce more value. So at the margin, yeah. much more value is getting produced. And then multiply that by the fact that instead of the state allocating most of the capital like it does now, um, and and certainly destroying the majority of that capital, you've actually got professional capital allocators allocating capital um, in society in the um, into the areas that are the most profitable which by definition means that they're serving society's needs the best um, and with real like, pricing the, like an actual pricing with, mechanism that's legit exactly <laughs> exactly like um you know allowing the, the the informational nature of the price system to, to do its job which, which we just don't let it do like those three things multiplied together creates pr a kind of pr and then obviously you've got Jeff's element of, of deflationary, te the technological, um, the deflationary effect of technology and the wealth creation of that effect l allowed to run its course. Like the, the prosperity of, of all those things multiplied together is, is almost unimaginable. Unimaginable. I can't, I can't actually imagine. Yeah, this, yeah and think this about is... two other things actually that you, you're talking about like the deflationary pressures. So at the same time that those, those effects are kind of feedback, creating a feedback on each other. Um, you also had the fact that just naturally, everyone is increasing their purchasing power because all of our added productivity is being split among society, among everyone who is holding the sound currency, everyone's purchasing power increases corresponding to the amount of production that they have put into it. Um, so you have you're you're done with the whole minimum wage problem. You're like uh, there there a minimum wage is actually a huge problem because it's going to be paying people too much at some point, and you just have to you have to get rid of it because it's it's going to be minimum wage will be wealthy, incredibly wealthy at some point. Um, and uh, and then go back to your your point that you were talking about how like everybody's trying to get rid of the responsibility is that you know that first moment when you withdraw your bitcoin to your keys it's scary like like you have this mental shift and you're like holy crap this is totally mine mm. well we have a an epidemic of depression um and we have we have an epidemic of people who feel that they have no control and they have no meaning in their lives. And so much of that comes from the fact that they aren't in charge of any of it. They are responsible for absolutely nothing in their lives. They live cradle to grave with the government basically in charge of everything. And we have reached a point of peak get rid of responsibility. They're now they're now afraid of the very thing that's going to give them back meaning in their lives. They're running from responsibility as fast as they can. And as that starts to flood back in, even having control over $50 worth of value to realize that that's wholly your responsibility, that is going to completely change the mental framework of people who actually see hope in their future like the the my friends and like family who are in the quote unquote legacy mindset it's shocking how hopeless these people are like they literally think that i have these conversations with people and they're just like everything's been invented 
Like, we're just at the peak of society, and it's shitty, and everything's going to be terrible. There's no real hope for the future. Um, uh, everything's getting worse and more violent. And I've never been so hopeful ever. Like, I've never I, – I look at the yeah. world, and I see – there's more to invent and discover than there has, has ever been because we now have the tools to discover a hundred thousand times what we could have discovered 30 years ago. And, and not to mention the, all, you know, the, the fucked up patent system. I mean, you know, yes. I've, been, I've been really researching a lot about this shit, about the patent system. I mean, how many technology, I mean, I know, you know there's a lot of theoretical bullshit out there probably, but how many innovative stuff is there uh, uh, in the closets of the patent system or seized in the name of national security or you know just uh, by corporations uh, and not you know not actually serving humanity but this yeah. is this is a, a really stupid game they're playing and i think once we have this uh, you know this monetary economical root structure the um with Bitcoin, to, to, we could unleash unimaginable technological innovations. I'm talking about every field, not, not just AI and robotics and stuff like that. I'm really, really talking like infrastructural stuff, like transportation, mm -hmm. energy production, energy conversion. Uh, I mean, just imagine we could literally, you know, start, you know, start, you know, or stop, stop burning fuels and going, you know, to the next stage, like whatever that is, you know, would it be flying drones or magnetic gravitational field strength, plasmatic, uh, whatever that is, you know, but, but uh, we, it's, it's 2020 and I think it's really overdue. And this is why I'm so excited about this vision, uh, doing like uh, together with some creative people like you guys, like at least a small teaser, if that is possible at all, like three minutes, like capture the spirit, the, you know, the attention uh, and, and, and the, 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 the excitement, you know, of people like this is, this is the future we can have, you know, it's reachable. Yeah. Yeah, you could tell, I think that's actually a really good way to promote something too. Um, not just like promote the possible future of, of Bitcoin, but just in the idea of like trying to reach out to uh, uh, investors or get somebody excited in a project is to produce the ad for it, produce the yeah. trailer yeah. for the project and say, do you want to see this movie? You know, because yeah. we could make this, we could, we could pull resources together and we could really tell this story. Um, and I think there is so much opportunity to give people hope. I think people are just flat hopeless. Um, like, like they feel like the, the world is going to shit and there's nothing to look forward to. And I, I got to tell you, I would, I'd be right there with them if mm -hmm. it weren't for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I really don't know if I would be happy about the future. Even with all the pain and the the stress that I think we will see and the 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 costs of the transition um, that we're going to go through, I think the other side of this thing truly looks amazing. You know, I think there's massive good that's going to come out of this. Yeah, and as I said, you know, we don't need to do like you know, fantasy stuff, utopian stuff, but all the things that even, you know, Jeff Booth has been constantly talking about, like, what does it mean in the, to live in a de deflationary environment? That means you work less, you go much earlier into re retirement, you are, you can buy much more stuff, you can save for the first time, you know, you can save, you can save money, you can, you know, uh, uh, you, you'll have like, literally like 10, 15 hours per week work, and the rest you do, you do like really, st uh, you know, the uh, stuff that, that, that excites you, that, that interests you, you know, you, you teach children, you do art, you do, you do creative stuff. Uh, children will be, you know, brought up like homeschool, like totally intelligent, unleash the total creativity and the total potential. I'm a total fan, you know, of what Daniel Prince is doing with, with, with his children, because I mean, I'm becoming, you know, um, we're expecting a baby girl in, in, uh, end of December or beginning of January 2021. So, you know, we already, con I, mean, I mean, I'm very concerned, you know, how is our child going to grow up in what kind of society, what kind of environment, you know, in what kind of indoctrination, you know? So, uh, 
so this is, you know, you talk, you talk about hope, but let's give them something more than just hope. Let's give them a, a real a tangible vision. You know, what does it mean to live in a deflationary society with Bitcoin? You know, what does it mean for the average person? And I think if you look at what's out there, or, or if you look for, and I certainly, I've, I, in the early days of my interest in Bitcoin, did this, you go and Google Bitcoin documentary, because uh, you think, oh, there must be a, a film out there that, that sort of sums this up. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, the sort of more mainstream documentaries about Bitcoin, they're a few years old now, and they haven't aged particularly well, I don't think. Um, and, and to give them, to not be too critical, I think um, they were produced in, a, in an era where, we, we hadn't the, the narrative that, that that we've developed now hadn't really um, been perfected. So there, you know, that you can see in them this this confusion about um, about what Bitcoin actually represents. Whereas I think in the last two or three years, um, you know, I think that that vision of the future has been um, really really worked on and, and developed um, to the point where. Yeah, you know, we, we there's a community out there that that does share share certain values and and share a sense of hope. Um, so so I agree that um, it would be amazing to to find a way to 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 leverage everyone in, in a way that can can express that, um, be it in a film or some other media. And, and I don't think it needs to be. Um, expensive to do um, and, and certainly the, the traditional way that you'd make a documentary is hard these days in, in that you can't travel like I, I mean I'd you know I'd, if I'd love to embark on a project like um, in the traditional sense in terms of getting out and collecting footage and interviewing people but you, you just can't uh, I'm not allowed to, to leave my my city so um, you know I think there are there are certainly that's not a not a problem there are other ways to do it and that's I think what motivated me to take the path that I did in that um, you know it, it's really just capturing the the right spirit um, it doesn't have to have the most amazing production values um, you, you know you can you can do these things on a budget as long as you're um you know you're coming at it from the right way and um and you know presenting something that is entertaining but but hopeful as well no yeah definitely um particularly with like the whole uh production budget sort of thing it's 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 kind of amazing how far your your purchasing power can go in this day and age uh, that you can stretch and actually get incredibly high quality work out of a small amount of money. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's increasingly so, I think, with the explosion of remote work and um, uh, basically the, the gig economy that we're seeing today. Um, and it's been accelerated by COVID um, and this whole lockdown thing. Uh, and, you know, everybody's got a camera now so it's not out of the question that we that you know you do a zoom um or like go a little bit more elaborate on the setup and like walk through to get like good footage um but everybody's got that everybody's got that 1080p camera in their pocket um all you need to do is walk them through a good, some good lighting and a, get them in a decent corner <laughs> and yeah it could be something as i agree guy like as simple as getting a hundred people together um you know, for, for the the we think share the, the the vision and getting them to to record themselves explaining what Bitcoin means to them and and the, why they're so hopeful for the future. And if you could if you could put that together, like that'd be a pretty powerful message. Yeah, and maybe integrate you know some uh, uh, you know as you said you know nowadays it could be I think really uh, cheap or really affordable to do or, or realistic you know to integrate some some kind of you know, uh, not science fiction, but but like a futuristic <laughs> pictures, you know, animation or some kind of, of of vision, you know, that we could like integrate. Like, what does it mean, you know? To you know, it's it's this vision that I'm trying to communicate, you know, to people. Like, this is the future that we could live uh, in, you know, and 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 it's a totally different society. It's a diff different environmental conditions. It's uh, this is real liberty this is real freedom and i think once we have that concept uh, uh ready to go uh, i think the the implementation the translation of that whole thing uh, 
I, I imagine. I'm not sure. I'm not a filmmaker, but but uh, what do you th what do you guys think? I mean, do you think that's realistic to do like a three minute or whatever ten minute? You know, it's just a short teaser. Oh yeah, that that part of the project in particular is is really feasible, and I, I particularly like the idea of kind of the theorizing on Galt's Gulch. You know, <laughs> like. Like what? What might it look like when incentives are aligned and take advantage of Richard? What you were saying with the different, um, uh, like look at the incentives of actually being able to save for the future, of uh, uh, you know having our purchasing power increase, mm -hmm. feeling like we're not dependent on somebody else or desperate to just vote the right person to fix all of our problems, but that we're responsible. Uh, we're responsible and in charge of our own lives and we have some sense of control um and independence back um and so just all those different factors involved and and look at this def deflationary push in technology and to actually see it spread like i think we actually have so many of the elements today that we can look at like one of the things about uh, what's that what's that quote um the future is already here it's just not evenly distributed or it's just not widely distributed whatever it is It's like we don't really have to fantasize about things that don't exist yet. We can take what does exist, but people don't have access to, and just extrapolate out what what it would look like when everybody does have access. Um, and so, so, so I think there's a very conservative in the sense of predictions, like you know, not going fantasy Star Trek <laughs> sort of future, but. But just taking what what is real and what is truly possible, and saying, could we build this if we had the freedom to do so, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and yeah. see what that might look like? Mm. Yeah, I agree. It's that it's the it's pushing that point of the empowerment of of freedom, and the concept of freedom, and how that lets people build their own vision of the future that they want, rather than necessarily imposing a specific vision uh, of the future yeah yeah i totally agree um, and uh, if there's ever a message that is feels like it's buried in the dirt and we need to uncover um it's reminding people what the hell freedom is everybody's completely lost yeah. what the hell that is like that like it's just seems like a distant memory at this point <laughs> um and we need to bring it back like it fuels its own flame you know like if you t if you tell it right i feel like it it's it burns itself you know yeah. like so I, i would like to see i would like to think that that potential is really there um particularly in our current environment when people are looking for something for an answer to things um because we've we are we are lost at the moment yeah and i think we can really help people connect really empower them as you said you know to to connect the dots and i think this is what people are missing they they you know they can't see the the, the jungle you know or the, the forest from, <laughs> with all the trees so you know like connecting the dots and understanding the root causes and then the vision like oh so this is the solution now you know first they understand you know the root causes and now the solution is here you know so uh, i think connect and like understanding the bigger picture i think this is what's important to me is like uh, you know all this macroeconomics we've been intellectualizing the whole to all these facets around bitcoin i think too much already and maybe we need to zoom out once in a while and and look at the bigger picture like okay what are we trying to achieve here you know there are 7.88 billion people out there uh how can we you know everybody has got a different angle and i understand that you know and, and, and trigger points and and, and uh, inspirational motive motivations or whatever but um I think that helping them, empowering them to connect the dots, it's a huge step, you know, in the right direction. Mm. So guys, I really enjoyed this when it's, it's now 12, uh, 11.30, uh, mid, um, yeah, almost midnight, so. <laughs> Holy crap, that went by quick. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
And unfortunately, yeah, Reed couldn't join us, but next time definitely wants his internet because I had some you know, bandwidth and internet issues myself yesterday. And so I don't know what's going on. Um, so yeah, if you, do you have any, any other input or creative? I mean, we could continue this talk like next time and maybe go even deeper or, or maybe bring in some other people who could compliment us or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, be a good addition. But I'm really serious. I, I, I want to do this, but I think we need, uh, yeah, definitely. We need time, resources, energy. And I think if the, if the teaser, if the trailer is you, as Guy also said, you know, it's like, uh, if that is effective, I think we can bring in much, you know, much more resources and people for, yeah. for you know, a real mm -hmm. movie. Wait for yeah. the next Bitcoin market cycle to play out and everyone right. will, will have a bit more capital to throw around. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's, that's the other thing too, is that uh, just the nature of the bull cycle will lend it to people feeling like uh, it's not a bad idea to start putting capital into something like that. Um, whereas uh, right now, kind of what we're looking like at the bottom curve of it, it's like everybody's hold a hold a hold like harder than you could possibly imagine, um, <laughs> uh, because they're they're seeing that the the climb up the mountain. Um, so I think that will just come with time. But but I think it's actually a really good idea to keep an avenue open. You know, start a group or something and keep conversations and dropping hints and uh, little tidbits, you know, what would it be called? What would be the, sh the, the, the fundamental narrative that is being told? Um, uh, what, what different way, what creative new ways could we do? Is, is it just going to be, is there something other than just interviews? You, you know, like, like start thinking about the actual implementation of this thing and how we could tell a fascinating story in a, in a new unique way that, um, it could be done in this environment, in, in this community. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's a great idea to at least get the conversation rolling. Yeah, um, and who knows, maybe we can get even, you know, Titus Gable and Jeff Booth interested because, you know, they have a vision. They, you know, it's, they had, you know, I know Jeff Booth, he did it, you know, he wrote the book, especially for his children because he wants his children to, you know, live in a totally different world with, you know, with, 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 with opportunities, with, with a vision, with, with hope. And so, you know, I think it's important to touch upon these, uh, the, uh, the, the, you know, the real reasons, the root cause, like why are people doing s specific stuff, you know, would it be entrepreneurship or writing a book? So, you know, uh, and, and it's good to, you know, uh, bring in this, uh, this wisdom also into the, into the whole conversation. Yeah, Kevin, thanks very much for, for bringing everyone together and, and your sort of passion for, for driving this um, this vision. I think it's great. I think we should um, get a telegram group or something going and, and invite people in and, and continue the discussion. Yeah, and just brainstorm. Yeah. And I hey. actually got a group uh, that's just kind of a, a couple of uh, us rally Bitcoiners. Um, and uh, it was the one that we organized. The It's the Bitcoin and film group. Um, and it's the one we organized the um, the lightning living on lightning uh, or, or Bitcoin in 2020 video um, that we had a whole lot of fun with just running around town and just we just lived the whole day off of lightning network um, and fold. Oh, nice. Uh, and uh, so maybe maybe I'll just get everybody thrown in there and we can kind of we can just kind of start, you know, sure. keeping the conversation rolling. That's it. Yeah. Sounds great. Sounds good. Okay, guys. Thanks so much, and I hope to talk to you soon. And uh, yeah, um, absolutely, dude. Thanks so thanks, much for having me. Thanks, guy. <laughs> yeah, Appreciate yeah, it. dude. Good talking to you, Richard. Okay. Okay, Richard. Okay, bye. Bye, bye. Later. Hey, how'd you guys like this? Make sure you follow Richard James and Geese Swan on Twitter, and watch the short movie produced by Richard James, Hard Money Film. I'm gonna put those in the show notes, and of course, listen to the fantastic Bitcoin Audible uh, by Guy Swan, and. Yeah, um, if you have any suggestions, feedback, um, or you want to, you know, uh, work with us, cooperate with us, or you know anybody in the creative business, in the film industry, in the movie industry, who, you know, uh, not only believes, but trusts and comprehends um, the, you know, this much, much bigger vision 
that we have, that, which is really in close proximity. It just, we need to implement this. We need to communicate the bigger picture. What, what is the future going to look like? What is human civilization, human society going to look like in whatever you know, format with its free private cities, citadels? So I would really appreciate if you follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platform, leave me a positive review, retweet it, share it, whatever you do, it helps. You know, share this educational material, uh, the education, the, the inspirations, the ideas behind it, the ethos, and love, share, retweet, follow, and subscribe. Thank you so much again, and talk to you soon. Bye.